Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, January 22nd, 2022. The title of this lesson in Boyd's commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School commentary is, God Promise Light in Darkness. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. And before we get started, let's start with a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask you to be with us as we go through your word, Lord. Lord, let your word reign today, Lord. God, show us how you are the light of our life, the pathway that we should follow, Lord. Lord, we thank you, love you, and honor you. And it's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture will be coming from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 through 10, and we'll be the New King James Version of the Bible today. Now, the main thought will be coming from Isaiah chapter 58, verse 10, which says, If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as noonday. Now, the aim of our lesson is by the end of this lesson, we will summarize Isaiah 58 to determine the action that God wants his people to take, repent from the ways and time when we offered false rituals and prayers to God, and enact God's justice and mercy as an affirmation of God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Now, as we do each week, we'll start with a little bit of background. We're now in the eighth lesson of the second quarter in the unit titled, God Promises. This week's lesson is coming once again out of the book of Isaiah. Now, the book of Isaiah was written by the prophet Isaiah, whose name means salvation of Yahweh. Yahweh. His prophecies came between 739 and 681 BC in a nation that had turned a deaf ear to God. The book is filled with sobering accounts of Israel's sin and rebellion and warnings of their coming judgment. But also along with these warnings, Isaiah offered a message of hope, a suffering servant, a coming Messiah who would come to establish God's kingdom on earth and create a new Jerusalem. Now, the book of Isaiah reveals God's judgment and salvation. It shows us that God is holy, 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 and therefore he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. So Isaiah pray, uh, um portrays God's oncoming judgment as a consuming fire. But at the same time, Isaiah understand that God is a God of mercy, grace, and compassion. And the nation of Israel is bl blind and deaf ears to God's commandment. So Judah then is compared to a vineyard that shall be trampled. Only because of his mercy, though, that God's pro and God's promise to Israel will God not allow Israel or Judah to be completely destroyed, and He will instead He will bring restoration, forgiveness, and healing. Now, more than any other book in the Old Testament, Isaiah focuses on the salvation that will come with the Messiah. The Messiah will one day rule in just and righteousness. The reign of the Messiah will bring peace and safety to Israel. Through the Messiah, Israel will be the light of all the nation. The Messiah's kingdom on earth is the goal towards which all the book of Isaiah points. It is during the reign of the Messiah, whom we know to be Jesus, that God's righteousness will fully be revealed to the world. And this is where our lesson picks up today in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 and 7, which says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen? to loosen the bonds of the wicked and undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free and let you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, then you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. When we're looking at this, the prophet notes that the people of Israel are complaining. We find at this time the people are complaining, and this was what God's response to their complaining. They're complaining that their fasting and their um, sacrifices um, should be pleasing to God. 
and their condition should be improving, but it wasn't. So God's response here is letting them know that they're basically hypocrites. See, in verse 3 and 4 of Isaiah 58, God told his people that they were serving their own interests in the days that they were fasting, that they were oppressing their workers, and they were quarreling and fighting with one another. This behavior is not consistent with the desired fasting that God wants, which is supposed to help um, those fasting to humble themselves before God. God is saying, if you want to humble yourself before me, then you must avoid being proud, arrogant, and quarrelsome in the relationship with the member of your human family um, of which you're part of. This is, they're being religiously observant, but only in hope for selfish and material gain. Now, before we go any further, because this lesson is talking about the light of God, but it dives quite a bit into fasting. So what is fasting? Fasting is, an essential, is essentially giving up food for a period of time in order to focus your thoughts on God. While fasting, many people read the Bible and pray and worship. Fasting uh, was founded in the Old and New Testament of the Bible over 70 times. Now, in the Old Testament, it was often a way to express grief or a means of humbling oneself before God. In Psalms 35, 13, David would humble himself with fasting. In the New Testament, it was a mean of going closer to God through meditation and focusing on him. In the book of Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Jesus went into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. And in Matthew 6, um, 16 and 18, we learned that we aren't to look for, you know, somber in, in, in fasting and look like we are, we're so frail and tell everybody that we're fasting. Otherwise, we're, we're getting our reward. But when we fast, we're, we're to keep it in silent and let it be between us and God. Throughout the New Testament, fasting and prayer was often mentioned together. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 13, verse 3, it says they fast and prayed. Even in Luke, a widow worshiped day and night, fasting and praying. So when it's all said and done, fasting is done to, to humble themselves and to get closer to God. With that definition in mind, the Israelites claim to fast, but not be getting closer to God, not receive any relief from God. The problem was that, that God had with the Israelites is they were, it's not that they were fasting, but why they were fasting. They, they weren't fasting the way God said they should fast. See, this is a message that Jesus later developed and delivered with great passion. It's not what we do that matter, but it's why we do it. If it's done in selfish action, even fasting and sacrifices are, are made for, for the negative. It's selfish reading. It's simply created out of negativity, out of the selfishness that we want in our life. There's no spiritual good in it because there was no spiritual good in the initial intention. This is why we are to be cheerful givers. This is why the Bible constantly is about the heart. It, what we do, uh, Jesus mentioned several times that, you know, praying on the corner in front of people and all that stuff, if it's not done for the glory of God, if it's done so people can think of you as being holy and think of you being um, righteous, then you already got your reward. Instead, Jesus say, what we do in our heart, our intentions is what counts. God tells his people, if you want to fast a way that pleases me, begin by getting right with your brothers and sisters. Stop oppressing others, and, and, and instead you should reach out to others for help. Stop acting wickedly towards others. This means that getting right with God begins by stop doing evil towards one another. Then, God is saying that they, once they start acting lovingly towards one another, they get it right with their brothers, their fasting and their prayers will be heard by God as they continue to love other people. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, he says, truly I tell you, whatever you do for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The same is true with so many of us today as we request, make our request to God. We ask God to forgive us and our trespasses 
then that requires us to forgive others. We know God is our providers and he requires us to provide for others. See, the true worship um, provide the material needs to the lives of others and do not attempt to, you know, um, conceal themselves from the needs of others who are lacking, including in family members. The scripture reminds each and every one of us that God expects us or should I say, commands us to show love and gratitude to him by loving and helping one another, especially those who cannot return the favor. Now, as we move to verses eight and nine, God tells them the results of true fasting. It read, then your light shall break, break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, I am here. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the fingers and the speaking wickedness. The word then we find in the beginning of verse eight introduce a description of what happens after the Israelites fast as God directed them to. If God's people was covered was coupled with fasting with the with the life that's of righteousness and love, then they will see their prayers answered. They will um, have lives full of light, full of healing, full of righteousness, full of the glory of God. When they call out to him, God will answer if they live according to God's will. If they fast according to the way God required them to fast, which God say they have to stop doing some stuff and start doing what he requires them to do. So when we look at this, first, God promised that thy light break forward as the morning. See, the word thy light apparently here refers to God's salvation and a national prosperity after the people repent and begin living according to God's instruction. The people who had been in darkness because of their hypocritical and insincere worship will be surrounded by the light and God is light. The word break forth implies a sudden burst forward as the light of dawn suddenly replaced the darkness of the night. If the people follow the Lord's instruction, they will see a sudden change in their own lives. Secondly, when we look at this verse, God said that thy health shall bring forth, spring forth speedily. The word translates here of health signify healing of a wound. Is a, in a figurative sense, it's restoration. Things and conditions that, that had diseased them due to their disobedience will be restored to full health. But again, the emphasis is on the speed for which the restoration would happen. When, when God's people honestly face their spiritual sickness and bring forth fruits of, of, of repentance, their restoration will happen rapidly. Listen, the moment we give our life to Christ, it's not the next day or the next hour. The moment we give our life to Christ, we have salvation and we have eternal life. It happened expeditiously. So obedience will result in more than a material well-being for the people here. It not only it is a restoration of their connection with God. Third, the Lord promised, it says, and thy righteousness shall go before thee and the glory of the Lord shall be the rear guard. So the word here, thy righteousness, is referring to God himself. The Lord is the righteousness of his people. The prophet Jeremiah stated that he shall be call, called the Lord of righteousness in Jeremiah 23, 6. The Lord would go before the people in all his holiness and prepare the way before them if they allow them. And then the, in the Lord's glory will be the rear guard of the people. The idea here is God, um, God's people will be likened to an army that's on the march and is led by the righteousness of God. And by being obedient to God, the people will be surrounded by him. The imagery here brings to mind the pillar of the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, which, the, which God guarded his people as they walked through the desert for 40 years. 
Finally, God promised what the people seemed to want the most, communication with him. When we look back at Isaiah 58, 3, or it, this was established. God said, then thou shalt call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he will say, I am here. This is a promise of an answer prayer. Nothing is more frustrating, brothers and sisters, and I'm sure you can attest to this in this life, than someone who knows God, then feel like he's not responding to the, the cry for help. Purely um, external worship, would not bring a favorable response from God. But those who conform to his will are assured and answer prayer. Therefore, in order to receive from God, the Israelites back then and us right now must stop oppressing people treat, and treating people like animals bound with a yoke. We have to stop pointing fingers at one another and, and trying to see who's at blame. We have to stop speaking wickedness. See, speaking wickedness here, when we find, it, it, is what we call, and each of these things I laid out are called sins of commission. Sins of commission is when we go out and actually do things against God and one another. If, if we walk right with God, we have to stop and guard against the sins of commission. Now, when we look at this, it, they're asking or they desire God to answer their prayer. And God say, when you do right by me and you walk in my will, then I will be here. I will hear you. Finally, when we look at verse 10, our final verse for today, God continues to tell them what they must do to see his light. Verse 10 says, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as new day. God in this verse gives them two things that they need to start doing. They need to start ministering to the hunger, hungry not just with food, but also extend the soul to the hungry. What does that mean? We know that faith come by, by hearing. That means not only do we feed people physically, but we feed them spiritually as well with the word of God. They had to look at the afflicted soul and actually seek to satisfy. Now, there's a difference between, oh, you just find something versus seeking something. That means we're to... Find people that need help and, and, and satisfy them. Now, failing to do this, failing to seek to help the poor in, in both physical as well as spiritual food, this is um, a, a sin of omission. Now, sins of omission is different than sins of commission. A sin of commission means we actually do something against God. But a sin of omission, these are the things that we should have done, yet we did not do it. If we're to walk right with God, we must open our eyes and do what was what is loving and kind and our duty before him. What does that mean? It's not okay to walk and drive by someone who's hungry and homeless and 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 need something and not offer something to them. It's not okay to know someone is suffering and you have the means to help them and don't. It's not okay to just talk about people and criticize them without giving them a word of hope from God. Whenever we don't do what God requires of us, that is the sin of omission. And we fall when we fail to do what God tells us to do is a sin of omission. God says that if we help others in needs, then, and this is the if-then clause here, this is, it, it requires action on our part before receiving God's reaction. God again promised that then shall the light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as noonday. Of course, this is referring to the light of God. This light of God is God's presence and his blessings is a result of us following his will and being obedient to him. Remarkably, God said that their light who is God, will burst forward suddenly out of the midst of obscurity, out of the midst of darkness. Once the Israelites repent of their sins and give him the worship that he reserved, uh, deserved from their sincere heart, God said he will be with them. He will never forsake them. This is what God tells us today. 
As a matter of fact, if we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 14, this is important where God is specifically talking to the Israelites back then. But when we look at today, we serve the same God. God says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, what will he do? What's the then clause in that? Then I will hear them from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. See, brothers and sisters, the light of God will show up in the midst of their darkness and the affliction and, and the distant and the, the light of prosperity and, sh and joy shall spring forward in the dark night of sorrow and distress will become as clear as the day of peace and comfort. That means God will turn it all around for us when we first seek his kingdom. God will make our, our old new. God will help us in every situation when we humble ourselves before him, when we treat others the way we want God treat, to treat us, when we allow the light of God to be reflected in our life. Then, and only then, will God answer our prayer. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, the God of light, the God of hope, through his prophet, Isaiah here, calls us to fast that it is not just part of a mere charade in looking holy, but is to humble us in our relationship with our fellow human beings and is to help us see where we might be a part of the problem so that we might share in our resources with the less fortunate and reflects God's light in the darning through Jesus Christ, the light that shines in the darkness. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and you be blessed.